Welcome back. Welcome folks online to our first plenary panel, uh, Media Marketing and Communications. And so you've heard from Meredith from her perspective, educating you about reaching out to journalists. And actually, um, I just want another really quick uh, applause for her because that was so applicable beyond simply science. Um, and it gave me even some in new insight into the workings of contemporary media. So that was fabulous. So we have now from the other side, we have those journalists right here for you um, to whom many of you will be pitching later on in our speed pitch session here in person. Um, just to one real quick sec, one of the things after this, this meeting is over, and I was very sad because we won't have more in person, but one of our functions uh, as the task force is in fact to connect you throughout the next six months with representatives of the media who are interested in finding those experts, those, com uh, those uh, community members who are have been planning and who are putting on events. So make sure that you're staying in contact with us for our list of experts, as well as um, if you're a journalist, make sure you're on that list as well so we can connect you personally. Okay. For, I'm going to tell you who our presenters are, and then they will uh, present in order. Uh, so first is Jamie Carter, who is a freelance journalist. He is he writes for Forbes.com, Space.com, and he runs the website WhenIsTheNextEclipse.com. Uh, we next have David Barron, who is also a freelance journalist um, and former NPR science correspondent. His book, American Eclipse, is on the swag table. I was so pleased to see. So one of you in person will be able to win that tonight at the Witty Museum. We have April Orcutt. Uh, whose recent story a lot of you saw in aarp.com or .org and also virtuoso.com. Um, and uh, we have Bill Taylor, on me a meteorologist from Ken's TV5 here in San Antonio. Um, and then finally, we have David Heilbroner from Sandbox Films, who's going to uh, tell us ways to get noticed. So first up, please, Jamie Carter. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. Um, I like to call myself the world's only solar eclipse journalist. Um, yeah, go closer to the mic actually. Oh, sorry. sorry. I like to call myself the world's only solar eclipse journalist. I'm writing hundreds I of think. eclipse over the last five to 10 years. And um, I'm writing for Forbes.com, essentially, that's most of my job, space.com, sky and telescope, and my own website, which we just mentioned, when is the next eclipse.com but you all know the answer to that question. Um, so you should do anyway. So Meredith was talking about types of journalists. So I wanna talk about my type of journalist, which is the digital native uh, journalism. So well, basically websites, Nothing's being, nothing I write is being printed or hardly anything. So, but not really social media. I don't really do any of that stuff. So um, let's talk about Go finding eclipse journalists. Now, there are people out there who who do a lot of writing about eclipses. Uh, it, I probably do the most, but there are there are plenty of others if you if you Google us. It's I think I want to just say it's a two-way thing. We're we're being asked to write more and more of these articles just because of this, this, there's the demand. So yes, you want to get your events into into the public realm, but we also need to write about these things. So we need we need to be in contact. Um, someone just commissioned me 37, uh, 37 articles I've just been asked to write for one website about the total eclipse. Um, I've probably got another 100 of my own um, that I've got ideas for as well. So I do need some help. So basically, please help me. Um, so when, you, when you're helping me and people like me, and you want to publicize an event, do be really specific the what, where, when, why, and how much. When we're publicizing events, we need to know specifics because we need to, if we say we were doing 10 best events in Texas or something to go and see the eclipse, which is a popular kind of article, I want to know exactly the dates. I want to know how much it's gonna cost, where people can park their cars, all this kind of stuff. Um, any special things you've got going on, uh, I was reminded that one place I saw had a, an area roped off for photographers that it was advertising, which I thought was a fantastic idea. Also, how to buy a ticket, a web link. Go here, buy the ticket. Everyone's happy. This is just a very basic example of 
something I wrote recently, which was quite popular. And you can see it's just, it's one, it's two sentences, but it's got everything you need to know to go and book that event. That came from, I think that came from a press release. As Meredith said, um, we're really busy. Some journalists have to, she mentioned that some journalists have to write an article every day. Some journalists have to write three or four articles a day. In my experience, we're insanely busy. So any help is, is good. You can, you can do our job for us by doing press releases, of course. It's good to have interesting quotes on these press releases. We don't want, we don't want some politician just, or governor or something saying something really bland. We just won't use it. Always good to have an angle. Often it's about numbers. We've got, um, you know, the reason for the news. Maybe you've got a new speaker you want to announce at your event or you're close to selling out or something like that. It's all, it's all news, it's all good. Important not to fake it. You need to check your facts. Don't say, don't use lazy terms. Don't say line of totality. Don't say full eclipse. Don't use these meaningless terms that people use. You need to use the right language because reporters do understand solar eclipses, or at least some of them do, because they've reported on them before. Really important also is not to use uh, fake images. We see this quite a lot, especially with tour companies. Um, they just, they drag stuff off. Uh, catalogues and, and online image libraries and, and they just look ridiculous and you will be ridiculed I will do the ridiculing if necessary this is a uh, image I got actually yesterday from the Frost Science Museum in Miami which I thought was quite good you can see they've got branded glasses and they're, they're majoring on that which is a, a free advertisement for the for the event and you can see actually there's a little uh, telescope in the background as well, which is quite a good idea. You can mock up the event, perhaps. We don't want photos of empty fields where you intend to hold an event. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Also, you don't wanna subconsciously tell people not to come to your event. This is a really, this is Cleveland, and you can see two different pictures. Where would you go and see an eclipse there? It's, it's really obvious, but actually we see lots of pictures, cloudy pictures in eclipse articles. Um, so yeah, watch out for that. Here's an iconic picture from the from the last eclipse, which I managed to get get a story out of somehow. But he's there to remind me to tell you that you need to watch out for legal issues, um, of which he has a few. So basically, you don't want to break copyright. You have to supply images that journalists can use. Me personally, I work for a number of websites, but I am personally liable for any litigation that happens if I publish, or they publish on my behalf, an image that I supply that breaks copyright. So it's down to me. And if I'm nervous about using a picture, I just won't use it. So there's some language there you can use to go with it, images, but you must own the copyright to, to give images out. Don't use, there's websites like pexels.com, Pixabay. I wouldn't use them, I, I don't trust them. Make images easy to handle. Um, for websites, we're talking landscape shape, 16 by nine, small files, you can email them, but generally it's best to send Dropbox links and Google, Google Drive links and things like this. Try not to make a journalist download six gigabytes of files. They, they could be on a, on a cell phone, on a train or something while they're writing your story because they, they may just get a few hours notice. Uh, finally, ethics. Um, Meredith mentioned never ask to see an article before it's published. It's against my personal code of conduct. I've actually had to sign a contract with some websites to say I won't let people look at articles before I publish them. So bear that in mind. You, of course, you can suggest corrections after. But, and, and actually, it's good to revisit articles that are online perhaps a few months before the eclipse because situations change, right? You don't want people trying to attend an event which is long sold out and you're starting to worry about how many people are going to turn up. So here's a, a picture of uh, an article I did recently about Monument Valley, which thousands of people were intending to go to to see the Ring of Fire and now no one can go essentially. So it just, 
I had to update about 25 articles after that news came out. I, I broke the news, but I had to update all of my articles. So that's that's good to know. Um, and that's it. So that's my seven minutes, I think. Please, again, tell me, tell me your story. This is me on Forbes. This is my website. I desperately need your help, and you desperately need my help. So let's work together. Thank you. Thank you so much. When, when I was talking with Jamie earlier this year and he was telling me about the photos, um, we that instigated, we set up a series of uh, Google folders for journalists. So we are seeking those exact kinds of photos that Jamie was looking for. Copyrights described photos of your region and we're, we've sorted it by region so that over the next six months, it will make that very, very easy for those seeking the information to find. Uh, so make sure you find me if you have those and tell your colleagues in your own regions. Okay, next up, please, David Barron. Thank you, and that slide is intentionally black, but it should change in a moment. Uh, so my name's David Barron. I'm a longtime Eclipse chaser, and I'm a science writer. These days I write books, most uh, importantly this one, uh, called American Eclipse, which tells the true story of a total solar eclipse that crossed the American West in 1878, including Texas. Um, and I'll talk about that briefly tomorrow. But during most of my career, for almost 30 years, I was a journalist. I worked in public radio. And way back in the 1990s, I was a science correspondent for NPR. Uh, and in that job, I frequently reported on astronomy, including solar eclipses. Uh, this is a link to a piece of mine from a morning edition the day before a total solar eclipse in 1999. Now, it's safe to say that the day before an eclipse, say on April 7th of next year, there'll be no difficulty getting newspapers, TV stations, and radio to cover the event. But uh, that's still six months away. Now, between now and then, we have a lot to do to educate and inform the public to make sure that everyone is ready. And you'd hope that the news media would spontaneously take up this task. After all, isn't public education just another term for news? Well, the answer is no. Sure, educating the public is part of what news organizations do, and there will be some stories that give straightforward information. In fact, we're already seeing many stories like this, but there are only so many times that a news organization can run the basics. A newspaper is not a textbook. It's not an, an almanac. If we're going to keep the eclipse front and center in the public's mind for the next six months, we have to be more creative about encouraging uh, media coverage and that means offering reporters and editors information in a newsy form. So what does that mean? Well, in my brief remarks here, I'll go over some of the key traits that journalists are looking for in stories. And I'll illustrate them by showing some actual stories from 2017 between February and July. So from six months to three weeks before the total eclipse that year. Well, perhaps the most obvious trait of news is that it focuses on what's new, what's happening now, not what's happening half a year from now. Remember, you're competing with everything else that's going on, a possible government shutdown or the latest heat wave. So when you talk to a reporter and you say, I'd suggest you write a story about the eclipse that's going to happen in April, they'll almost always say, okay, I'll do that in April or maybe in March. Well, one way around that is to provide what journalists call a news peg, a reason to do the story now. Now that might be an event that you're holding now, say a planetarium program about the eclipse that you've just launched. That's news because it's happening now. That's a story that a local paper in Pennsylvania ran four months before the total eclipse in 2017. What else might you do now to bring the news media's coverage to the eclipse. A business in the path of totality in 2017 sponsored an eclipse-related art contest. That brought attention to itself and to the eclipse five months before the moon's shadow arrived. A more practical sort of thing, Lipscomb University in Tennessee held an education summit in the summer of 2017 and made the eclipse its theme. That drew press attention. Indeed, this very workshop would make an excellent subject for a news item 
especially in the San Antonio papers. Uh, it's happening now, and it possesses another favorable trait for the news media. Local news outlets, of course, prefer local stories. Six months before the total eclipse in 2017, the paper in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, reported on how local officials were preparing. That's always a good angle, finding a way to localize a national story. The paper in Greenwood, South Carolina, took a similar approach. It, it examined how the local university was preparing for the eclipse. Preparations, that's news. What challenges are people facing now to get ready for next April? Another important point, you may think of the eclipse as a science story, but what most interests news editors are stories about people. So how can you humanize a story about the sun and the moon? Well, offer unusual, passionate people for journalists to talk to and profile. And eclipse chasers tend to be just that, good characters. A South Carolina paper profiled a man who saw his first total eclipse in 1970 and was inspired to become an astronomy professor. The University of Virginia's paper ran a similar profile of one of its professors and used that as a way to alert the public uh, that the eclipse was coming. Profiles of scientists who plan to study the upcoming eclipse are also popular stories, especially when they're citizen scientists and even more so when they're kids. Everyone likes stories of kids and pictures of kids. And that's another enticement to a reporter, good images. Now, obviously this doesn't apply to radio, but for TV and newspapers, compelling visuals help sell a story. Okay, one more key trait to think about when pitching a story, and that's the element of surprise. A topic is newsier the more unexpected it is. That's the cliched idea that Dog bites man is not a story. Man bites dog, that's a story. So try to pitch stories with an element of the unusual. Maybe it's a new musical composition about the eclipse that was a good story in Chicago in July of 2017. And if you'll allow me a brief tangent, I hope there will be a similar good story here in Texas because my book has been turned into a musical. Uh, and <laughs> uh, there's... A there's actually, there's talk of a performance being staged in Waco in early April, so stay tuned. All right, one final example. What if you found a story that combined all the traits I talked about? What would it look like? Well, it might be something like this. Employees of a local company had just produced the world's largest pair of solar eclipse glasses. Sure, this was a, this was a gimmick, but it was new local, human, visual, and certainly surprising. And that made it a story that uh, was too enticing for the Memphis paper to ignore fully six months before the eclipse. Uh, so I'm happy to talk more about this during the question and answer, and I'll be at the pitch session, I think, this afternoon as well. So thank you. Okay, you, you came for information, you're getting information, concrete tips. And next up we have April Orcutt. Hi, my name's April Orcutt and I'm a freelance journalist um, who writes about travel and total solar eclipses. And um, earlier I was a college professor and before that a producer of public affairs and documentary television programs. Uh, my first job was on an astronomy college telecourse called Project Universe, hosted by Dr. Edwin Krupp from the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I'm also an eclipsophile, and I've been lucky enough to see four total solar eclipses. Which button? There we go. Um, a joke among journalists is that editors love bright, shiny objects. That is, editors want stories that, that stand out. Bling! And no subject is a better... 
And no subject is a better bright, shiny object than a total solar eclipse. The problem is people who have not yet experienced a total solar eclipse don't understand how cool it is. They don't get what the fuss is about. Some don't even understand what a total eclipse of the sun is. One Town's Eclipse Fest website featuring many fun activities showed a beautiful photograph of a total eclipse of the moon. Okay. Moon, total eclipse of the moon. Um, I uh, emailed them twice before they finally changed it. When pitching your information, give the press a vivid and accurate picture so they're intrigued by your information. Editors and writers get hundreds of emails a day, so yours needs to stand out. You have to hook them in the first few words. That means avoiding press releases like, the Townville Science Center and the Townville Town Council are pleased to announce that this coming spring on April 8th, 2024, something very special will happen in Townville. No, instead add pizzazz. Hook them, grab them, paint a glorious picture. I've used this lead in some pitches. The universe has gone beautifully awry. The temperature drops. Daylight darkens eerily. Dots of sunlight on the ground turn into crescents. Sunlight on pale colors starts to ripple as though reflected through a swimming pool. Then the moon fully covers the sun, which instantly turns into a black dot in the sky surrounded by a diaphanous halo and stars and planets. If watching a total solar eclipse is not the most incredible experience you can have, it has few competitors. When Pitt Okay. Uh, present your most important information in a concise first paragraph. Many people don't read beyond the first paragraph of email. My query for a travel story started with a lot of information in a few words. The tourism industry is buzzing because it's time to plan your trip of a lifetime to see the astounding total solar eclipse next spring. Many towns in the eclipse path are planning special activities to celebrate this rare event. The amazing phenomenon where the moon blots out the sun so viewers can see the ethereal solar corona reaching out from the sun like a gauzy sunflower casts a 125 mile wide path from Mazatlan in Mexico to Newfoundland in Canada. On several occasions, when I pitched an eclipse story, editors have said, let's make this a travel story instead, because they don't understand eclipses. So the story changed from, you've got to see this incredible celestial event, to chasing a total solar eclipse as an excuse to travel. And that's okay. What's the focus of the publication you're contacting? What at your event would appeal to their audience? Children's activities, science education, spiritual experiences, cosmic curiosity, food, music, beer. So I have a request. Please emphasize total solar eclipse. None of this 99% stuff. Get readers to drive those last few miles to get into the path of totality. Find an analogy to show that seeing 99, a 99% partial solar eclipse is not the same as eating 99% of a pizza. I've written that 99% is like driving your kids 99% of the way to Disneyland <laughs> and then turning around and going home without going into the park. Alas, my favorite almost analogy I can't tell you because it's X-rated. <laughs> but you can go home and talk to your partner and see if the two of you can figure it out. <laughs> that was the totality slide, okay. Unfortunately, some eclipsophiles 
not the people in this photo, unfairly book four or five hotels in the path of totality and cancel all but one reservation a few days before the eclipse. So here's another important fact to include. Tell people to keep trying to get lodging, even days before the eclipse, because hotels will open up. Here are a few more tips for connecting with editors, writers, or producers. Know the names of the media people you're contacting. Look on the publication's websites or call the receptionist to ask their names. Make your requests personal and spell their names correctly. Tailor your press releases to the goals of the media you're contacting. Put the most important information in a memorable and concise first paragraph. Keep subject lines and emails short. Get straight to the point like headlines do. Make the subject of your press release or email a potential headline for the story you want them to tell. Here are headlines from past Eclipse stories. For luxury travel magazine, where to see next year's total solar eclipse in style. Other ones have been create a stellar experience for the 2024 total solar eclipse. Eclipsophiles dance and frolic during minutes of darkness. Totally awesome. Eclipse chasing is a prefer perfect excuse to travel. An experience that eclipses all. Total eclipse reveals world seldom seen. Chasing the moon's shadow. For podcasts and radio shows, uh, emphasize the soundscape. Uh, my favorite example was when my husband and I, and this is a personal photo, not a pro photo. Um, when my husband and I saw our first total eclipse in Hawaii in 1991. We had to get up at four in the morning. It was overcast. We're driving around trying to find a place where there was sun. And he was grousing. He's a nice person, but he was grousing, complaining, whining. We could be on the beach. We could sleep in. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. And when totality hit, he screamed for four minutes straight. <laughs> So find ways to create vivid imagery to intrigue readers and editors to reach for the most amazing of bright, shiny objects, the total eclipse of the sun. Thank you, April. Um, you know, frontline scientists, you know, very often, the main contact that regular members of the public have with science is through their local TV meteorologist. And so meteorologists are important conveyors of what's about to happen and also conveying the excitement of it. So next we have Bill Taylor. Thank you, thank you. Us tall people is probably better this way. Good morning. So good to be here. I've uh, been studying the skies since 1991. It started in Lake Charles, Louisiana, went to Montgomery, Alabama. And in 1996, I dropped anchor in San Antonio, Texas, because this is a great place to live. And I really love it. So I've been forecasting for quite a while. And what I want to talk to you about to reach the public, reach out to broadcast meteorologists. Okay, what is the number one reason why people watch local news? The weather, the weather, absolutely. So here's what Pew Research says. Television, still the most common place for Americans to get their news. One of the most preferred sources, local news. Local news specifically. It's very important. See, local TV average audience for late night time slots has the only one of seeing a bit of a change in the last year. And it was only 7%. And that's mainly because of Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime, right? Everyone's binging in those primetime hours. So that was the only hit we've taken in local TV news. According to Gallup, do you trust the news? This is the big one for 2023, right? 34% of people question have a great deal of trust in the media. Two-thirds, that means two-thirds of people, when they're watching the news, don't believe it. Two-thirds. And we know why. Government, politicians, politics, scandals in D.C., that's why. The difference here 
is local news. And what I'm here to explain to you that the number one reason people are watching local news for years, it has not changed, is the weather. That when people, viewers, will say, if threatening weather is going to hit my home, my neighborhood, affect my family, I'm tuning in every time. And local weather cannot be political. That's the beauty of it. There's no debating it. There's no opinions. This is what it is. Here's what's happening. Here's how long it's going to last. Here's how bad it's going to be. The technology's never been better. So there's no debate. There's no politics. It's straightforward. There's no team to fight against. When you're tuning into local weather, viewers are relying on their local broadcast meteorologists to keep them safe. It's a life-threatening situation. Mother Nature has a tendency of getting our attention quite easily when it comes to weather. It doesn't discriminate, right? It doesn't matter if you're Bill Gates or you woke up under a bridge. A hurricane will affect both the same way. So a broadcast meteorologist like myself has the best technology at our fingertips, groundbreaking technology that's able to keep people ahead of storms like never before, that has given us accuracy like never before. And that makes a difference because what this all leads to is trust. I mean, when we have all this technology at our fingertips, so do you. You're now you have access to all the same model information, but you don't have me to explain it. You don't have me who has been here 27 years and understands weather patterns in South Texas and this topography, this climate, and all of those factors that come into play. So trust is established with viewers. And that's why if you want to reach people, you reach out to us because people trust us more than anyone else on that new set. And we're the only ones on that set asked to predict the future, right? <laughs> I mean, the sports guy always gives me a hard time. I said, well, why don't you predict the Spurs score for Friday night's game? 40% chance that it's going to be 98 to 93, right? When this happens, this trust is established, like I said, when there's a tornado threatening a neighborhood and a family is huddled around an iPad or a phone and watching my live coverage, I now have their trust for life. I'm also the one who goes to their son's and daughter's school so that when they come home from school, they say, Bill Taylor came to my school today. It was incredible to learn about hailstorms and how tornadoes form. So it becomes a trust factor that you can lean into and use us for. And my colleagues here did a great job of explaining, do the work for us. I say us because of the newsroom. My first degree was in journalism before I started studying meteorology. So I have a lot of knowledge in what makes a story. And you know what it is today more than anything else? It's what gets people's attention. You have so many things competing for your attention. We wanna grab your attention for a few minutes two to three minutes at a time. It's gonna, that, that's the average length of a story. That's actually my newscast or my weathercast within a newscast is three to three and a half minutes on average. Now, if there's light threatening weather, it's, we're on till it's over. An average news story, a minute and a half to two minutes, if it's good, okay? A minute and a half to two minutes, that's all you've got. And the legwork, very important, not just to call and say, you know, y'all should do a story on the, no, no, no. Um, I've got someone who experienced the first solar eclipse in San Antonio, the first time they, or, you know, they have a great story to tell you, you know, we, we want the people. And if you have the legwork and you have it set up, you've got the person. It's fantastic. So it's trust with the public, but then there's also trust in the newsroom for someone like me. That's been there almost 30 years. There's only a few of us. You know, we have a high turnover of producers. We have a high turnover of anchors and reporters, a lot of young people that are new to the area. So when I walk in the newsroom and talk about, hey, we really need to cover this story or, hey, I've got a story idea for Thursday. Well, they're going to listen to me a little bit more because of my length of time here, my trust in that newsroom. So that makes a difference, too. And, and, and you know, generally speaking, Meteorologists have probably the longest tenure at most television stations. I think that's what you'll find across the nation, you know, that most of us stay where we like and enjoy because once we can get the handle on forecasting that weather, we don't want to try another one. You know, it's like I grew up in the Northeast. I'm glad I don't have to forecast snow and snow totals. That is, uh, -uh that's dangerous territory. So trust with the public, trust with producers in the newsroom. Okay. I know that we have the annular, 
or some of our young producers have actually written, I know it, the annual eclipse. I know you have seen it. Annular, say it with me, spell it out. The total in seven months, but when is the total eclipse of the heart? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Okay, so far, all of our presenters have fulfilled every fantasy I had as we were putting together our presenter list. And I'm sure the same will hold as David Heilbronner comes to the podium. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I'm, I get to go last, which is always good because I can, I, all the stuff I was going to say, I'm not going to say because these guys said it really well. I think my favorite takeaway is 99% of the way to Disneyland. I thought that was just, just that's a take home. Um, I'm here to talk about something fairly different than everybody else. This is, this is sort of aimed at the big dreamers in the room. Um, I'm talking about long form narratives that potentially can go national. Um, my, my background in that is I've been making documentaries for 30 years. My stuff's shown all over the world and we've, I vote on the Oscars, I vote on the Emmys, and I've had the bone chilling experience of hanging out in the editorial rooms of people who commission films and I've written books and I've hung out with editors. And the people who you really want to reach, if you want to get your story out there, are those people in the offices who say, what are we going to run? What's, what's not going to run? And um, how do you do that, right? It's, it's a high bar. There's way, um, the title of my talk was getting heard over the noise. And what I mean by the noise is, um, like for example, last year Sundance had 9,000 documentary submissions. That's just, you know, 9,000 films. You're never going to hear about 8,995 of them. Um, that's not everything that's streaming, everything that's on Twitter, books, magazines. It's just an enormous amount of media out there. And if you think, think about it too hard, you're just going to stay home and go, oh, forget it. It's not worth it. But it is worth it because if, if, you, if you swing for the backfield and it works, you get a story out there that really makes an impact, that goes, that goes national, can go international. And it's so gratifying. And you get, and if you have something you really feel is worth saying, it feels great to get it out there. Um, so how do you do it, right? I mean, I mean, it's great if you're, you know, if you're Stephen King and you're a genius and you just sit down and write a story and it sells. Um, but there are really ways to think about what is going to get through this immense amount of media noise that we all know is out there. I mean, like that's why series are so popular right now because. No one wants to watch a one-off anymore because there's too many choices. Which one am I going to watch? If I'm in a series, well, that takes care of like five whole days. I don't have to think about it anymore, right? Um, so, so first of all, David Barron really caught it right when he said story. Stories sell. You may have a fascinating piece of scientific information, but if you can't contextualize it in the story, it's, it's great. It'll, it could be the news you know, um, the daily news, but it's not going to be a national story. It's, or if it is, it's you, know, you have to say, you know, cure for cancer, done. You know, you're, you're, you've got a national story. But interesting things about the eclipse, you know, it's going to be a smaller narrative unless you find a way to put it into a human context, which again, is just what David was talking about. And, and um, sometimes it's a story you really wouldn't expect, you know, it's the quirk, it's, it's the stuff that you think is uninteresting until you step back for a minute and go, wow, you know, that's kind of cool. Like you have someone who's going to go, I'm going to go on mule back, you know, through the outback and, and take my whole family with me to watch this eclipse. And you think about that, and you go, what's that, what's that trip going to be like? You know, the kids are going to be screaming and there's mules, are you kidding me? And, you know, you send a cameraman along with them and it could be a really charming, lovely story that actually breaks out just because everyone goes, oh, you know, the, the animals and kit. And all of a sudden you have a science story, but it's in the context of something entirely different. And that is going to get you into the consideration zone of people who make the final decisions of are we going to run the story? Or are we not? Um, you, you know, make sure it is a story. You know, it's, you don't get an issue. You have to know the difference between an issue or an idea and a story. Right, a story has you know beginning, a middle, and end. It has characters. It goes somewhere. It's a human thing. It's not an intellectual thing. So bear that in mind if you really want to you know get something out there. It so helps right to nest your scientific information in something that it, literally anybody, whether they're sci science inclined or not, can relate to. In fact, I mean you'll reach a much broader audience, and they'll go, "Wow, I never thought science could be so interesting." Um, Sam. Sam um, 
Simons Foundation has funded um, sand, what's called Sandbox Films, which is sort of an independent branch of Simons. And they have gotten behind a documentary that we're doing on the uh, 2024 eclipse. And it's a court. When we started to look at it, this is an example of like what the thinking goes into this um, is I, I looked, I did some research and found out that the 2024 eclipse that, that you guys all know this is going to be one of the largest travel events in the history of the United States. And I went, wait a minute, like 40 million people are going to watch. When is the last time 40 million people agreed in America agreed on anything at all? You know, there's no winners, there's no losers, there's no ticket price. Um, and I realized, wow, like this is a portrait of America. You know, this is something. And, and when, when do Americans like step back and, and marvel together at something larger than themselves rather than argue and fight? And so it was a chance to tell a feel good story. And it's a story about different places. Um, we're not just going to, we're not going to try to profile everybody because that's impossible. So you choose who are the stories you're going to tell. Just as an example. Um, and again, there's a line I wrote, and it's, this is a line I've kept as a mantra for filmmaking forever. Don't tell the story. Don't try to tell every, say everything in your story. It's, it's a death. It's, it's a Wikipedia article and no one wants to, I mean, you do it for research, but you never do it for fun. Um, tell a story, stick with the family on the, on the mule, you know, and just don't worry about like everything else. Just focus on that and get it really vivid and beautiful. And it'll be so satisfying for as, uh, artistically and also for viewers. Um, there is this thing about timing. Long form takes time to do. You need to plan in advance on this stuff. They take months to prepare. Um, so think ahead. You know, if you really want, if you want to take this, this route, and it is, you know, the road less traveled, but if it works, it's, it's really exciting. Um, so plan ahead. And really, the only other things are two favors um, I'm going to ask you guys, which is when you use experts for this kind of stuff, use them sparingly. You know, people don't want a textbook. I think David, I think I'm putting a quote you a bunch of times this time, but because you're right, people don't want a textbook. They, they want to know the most exciting things pared down in the most communicative way you can finally get, you can get your experts to talk about them. And lastly, is beware the story that is too good to check. You know, there's so much, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is going to be the, I don't know, it's going to be the, the longest solar eclipse in the history of mankind. You know, probably not. So, you know, be, be accurate. Be fair, but be dramatic and swing for the backfield because when it works, it's great. So I'm here to ask and answer any questions later, but thank you. And as we are, are gorgeously back on schedule, we do have time for questions. Um, one of the things that I want to preface this with is, so these folks, as well as several other representatives of the media in the audience, will be we will be upstairs for the last session of the day it's an optional session where you'll be able to pitch your stories and get feedback uh from all of these professionals at, in a kind of speed pitch uh, session so start thinking about all of the tips that you've heard today start crafting your own pitch and uh, we'll be able to sort of swap in and out for that but of course if there are general questions we would really really love to hear them um, and if you are online and you have them uh, please put them in the chat and we'll be asking Tiffany to read them. Uh, we do have a microphone over there, uh, which will enable the folks at home to hear you as well. And make sure you introduce yourself, Sarah, as you're at the podium. There's a little switch on it. Hi. Hi. Oh, good. It worked. Uh, my name is Sarah Wolf, and I'm with Vincennes, Knox County in southern Indiana, right on the Wabash River. It's a little late for this idea. I mean, we, we are already planning for it, but for all of you going home who need nothing else to do, I wanted to tell you about an idea that we had for the halfway point for the total solar eclipse. We are having a half birthday party for the eclipse on October 8th. It's a Sunday night, uh, but it's an idea that you can take back with you as something that you can tell people that you're doing now-ish, as in, you know, like in a week. <laughs> but even if you throw together something relatively small or even just get it out on your social media, you could even have just the visuals of a birthday cake for the eclipse if it's cut in half. You see where I'm going with this? Um, it's just a little bit of storytelling in that aspect. We're going to have a moon cake walk 
because that's fun. Um, <laughs> we've got some live music. It's just a simple thing, but it's just an idea for you to take back with you. And one of the things that you can share that you're doing now uh, to your media. So that's all I got for now. Yeah. But Sarah's thanks. last name actually is because that's fun. Yeah. Um, and her strategy for helping Vincennes really be focused, you know, to help get media attention. Uh, she's made a series of continuing really funny videos. Um, so if Vincennes and Knox County Eclipse, look at them on social media, you will be inspired. Any other questions? Dan Schneiderman's coming up to the podium too. Fantastic. Uh, Dan Schneiderman from Rochester, New York. Uh, I'm looking at Bill. Could is there anything that the news crews could use um, both eclipses? Uh, one thing that we did after the 2021 partial solar eclipse is that we got filters for the news cameras. Would that be helpful again? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I, Can we ask the stations for a <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Um, I don't know those dimensions. I, I do know that those filters would be necessary. And I'm not even sure that our photography staff has that ready to go right now. But yeah, that's something that they would definitely need. And yeah, that's a good idea. This whole week, you can't hear from any expert or official. No mayor, no congressman, no, no one like that. We want to just get some people. And it would be some of the best stories that came out of that week embargo on talking to officials and talking heads because in the country, people, you hear what's really going on and, and you would connect with people a lot quicker. So have, have them available. I just ask a follow up there. Do meteorologists get a lot of pitches or, or do like, are you heard above the noise if you're talking to a meteorologist rather than to just a general news assignment report? Great uh, State will all say that, or you know, on a website, contact us here, contact us there, and they won't put the meteorologist email on there. But it's acceptable. Just go to the team, or you know, and our email and the social media are very good. Yeah. Emails will be much better than social. You know, so you know your Instagram messenger, you get flooded. So emails, you know, phone calls too. Some people feel like they're phone. <laughs> Excellent. Kate. Um, so Kate Russo being in the shadow. So we're setting up the event for Uvalde County in a few weeks time. Um, we're going to have a media hub resource center for the media there. Is there anything that you feel we need to help you with to provide you with the resources that you need to get the stories out? I think that's to anybody. Especially Bill, because you're here. <laughs> um, you know, Gets that work done, that leg work for them so they don't have to make any phone calls. You know, especially because in a lot of these newsrooms, the reporters that are new, they don't know who to call in their local markets yet. And they'll, they'll rely on somebody like me who's been here 30 years. So I, I know somebody at Scobie Education Center, call Rick. You know, I, I'll know people that they can reach out to because I've been here long enough. That's, yeah, that's what goes mm -hmm. through us. Okay. Okay. 
bright, shiny objects, whatever that's different, really unusual, really cool, uh, promote those things too. And I think one of the things people didn't mention were props. Y'all in TV love props, right? Yeah. So. And remember, every, every time you reach out, it, treat it as a sales pitch. Mm. You know, what I love about you, Val, when you're talking about it, it's the cross section, or they have the intersection of America because Highway 90 goes from Florida to California and Highway 83 goes from Mexico to Canada. Those two roads intersect in downtown Uvalde, Texas. And so the intersection of America will have the intersection of, you know, the eclipse and, and, and you know, write those headlines, use it as a sales pitch. Yeah. And on the day, so we've got a, a building that's there. So we're providing um, like desk space, internet connection, um, phone resources. We're just doing all those practical things for people to help get their articles out straight away. Um, and, you know, just practical things like that. So, um, yeah. It's Thank you. Practice, don't forget food. I'm not kidding you. I mean, you'd be surprised if you just say food will be provided, snacks will be provided. Just how much that that's a nice little ask. Yeah. Um, for, for Nashville in 2017, uh, we in Rochester, we sort of went to Nashville right after the 2017 eclipse and basically got their playbook. They did a fantastic job of uh, attracting international uh, attention and international journalists who flew to Nashville to Music City for this. And it wasn't just that it was Nashville and music and fun. They put together a fantastic media kit, which was an, a gilded invitation to press, letting them know that they would have all of these resources, the hookups they need, the, the, the technology and food and drinks and every amenity and that worked. So I'm telling you their secrets. Mm -hmm. All right, Rick Ames. Rick Ames, um, New Hampshire Solar Eclipse Task Force founder. Uh, first time to San Antonio, love your city, it's great. I gotta get down to the river walk at night. Um, I've been here since Wednesday and this is sort of San Antonio specific, uh, Uber drivers, Riverwalk people, just people in the hotel. No one seems to know much about the event coming in two weeks here. It's a dress rehearsal for us in New Hampshire. We're going to be following the live feeds. But my question is, I understand there's about 1.5 million. I'm just wondering how many glasses San Antonio has and what's your plan as all of a sudden people realize they need to get one and can the media help get the word out soon so that it because we don't want to get glasses from china that's a big thing. yeah so any ideas from anyone i think that might be the seal program yeah, so I have some glasses. I'm going to leave them with someone, maybe Rick or someone, but whatever I have and maybe any of us, because that's a lot of glasses for two weeks. So thank you. Yeah. If you the media can help us get that out. Here, where Here's what happened too, something to just keep in mind. That remember, uh, Ken's Five is part of Tegna. So I, I, if I spoke to most of you, I bet there's a Tegna station in your market. We have 73, I believe, across the United States. One of the things that they refuse to do because of the legality of the issue is glasses. I started talking to them about three years ago. We need to do glasses. We need to put Ken's five on our glasses. We need to be handing these out to the public. Let's do it. Let's brand. Let's brand. And we get here and... They can't do it because the attorney said there's too much of a liability of telling people, put our glasses on and look at the sun. And if something goes wrong, you know what's happening. So we backed off and we're not doing glasses. And I think, and remember, that's tech. So that, that's a, that affects a lot of TV stations. So I'm going to address the glasses issue briefly, but I think we need to come back to more how do we pitch the media type questions. Um, but uh, it was already mentioned that the libraries are doing this. This is the SEAL program. I'm doing 24 of the 27 branch libraries presentations, and everybody who comes along gets free glasses. The library has lots and lots of glasses. So that's definitely a way. We are doing other things uh, around um, schools, which would be UTSA funded. We're also providing glasses to Uvalde. 
Um, there's also, I know for a fact that Whataburger has bought glasses. They've already bought a bunch for, for the um, annula and they'll buy more after that. But, um, and if you're not from Texas, Whataburger is this weird Texas thing. It just is. Um, <laughs> there are entertaining jokes about it. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, the, it's a big burger place. So there are glasses getting out there. Um, I believe the SCOBY has some of their own. Witty Museum is selling them. The Dizium is selling them. So they're out there. Um, whether you can get them for free or not, that's another thing. But, um, and Lindsay in the back. Oh yeah, and HEB has their own. I don't think they're branded. I think they're just, you know, generic, but HEB is selling them too. And again, if you're not from Texas, HEB is everywhere. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so some of... Awesome. Hi, everybody. Rick Feinberg, mostly dealing with uh, people trying to get in and out of the Zooms. But uh, since you're all here, you're all on our mailing list now. And in the not too distant future, but after the annular, so it'll be for the total only, the task force will be announcing the availability of 150,000 glasses in batches of multiples of 500. Uh, these are glasses that uh, we produced in collaboration with NASA and the National Science Foundation and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So watch for an announcement. Um, these glasses will be available uh, probably completely for free, possibly for the cost of shipping. We're still working that out. And uh, they'll be available again in batches of 500. They're purely for outreach to be given away. They're not to be sold. So just keep an eye out for that. Thanks. One last question. Two. My name is Spencer Rackley. I'm with the Charlotte, North Carolina Charlotte Amateur Astronomers Club. Two quick things. If you're working with city fathers in a big area, don't forget to mention porta potties. Second thing is the day after the eclipse, it's easy to get a thousand of those eclipse glasses for 400 bucks. The day after the eclipse, I always call up Rainbow and say, send me a thousand more and give them away. They're great. <laughs> okay, excellent.